Now we'll go next to India. And I want to give you a little background on this. The Second Air Commando Group, as I said, uh, did its operational training at Harris Neck Air Force Base in Georgia. Our air base actually was constructed on the old estate of Pierre Lorillard, the founder of the tobacco company. And his mulatto mistress's grave was right outside our barracks. Here we are on the, on the flying line of Harris Neck Air Force Base, flying ancient P-40s. Later on, when we got in combat, we got P-51s. Thank goodness we never had to face the Japanese with these things. But they are a pretty old plane. They had a top speed of about, oh, possibly 400 miles an hour going downhill. That's Colonel Chase, our executive officer, with two factory reps. And there we are, just going off for a little uh, training mission. These were not our planes. These were planes that were assigned to us for training. And we left them and went overseas and, and, found, and got our P-51s over in India. Here we are in the troop ship. And this was a lovely experience. We were all alone, no convoy, no destroyers, no nothing. This was a fast ship built just for the troop carrying purpose. And it was fast enough to outrun Japanese submarines. So we zigzagged across the whole Pacific, and we didn't get sunk. We went to Australia, but we weren't allowed to land. And we arrived in Bombay uh, and then had to, uh, ta had to take a train across all of India to our operating base near Calcutta. These people you see are various friends of mine. Some are doctors. These are some of the pilots. Colonel Ball, with his hand on his chin, was uh, second in command after Chase. We had 12 squadrons, if you will believe it. I was commander at the time of an aerodrome squadron, 432 men. When we got to India, we had to build a base more or less from scratch. We took over on what was left of a B-29 base, which was mostly the concrete pads for the ships. All of that tent city that you see there was built in six days. When I came there to do the job, because by that time I was Group S4, the supply officer, I threw myself on the mercy of an English captain. He clapped his hands like this, and a man sort of just sprang out of the ground. He turned out to be a labor contractor. He said, what do you need, Sahib? I said, I need tents for 1,800 men. It shall be done, said he. I said, in six days. He says, yes, sir, I hear you. And in six days, he had about 2,000 workmen put up all the tents. Uh, they built the tennis courts for us. They built uh, those bashes, you see, with the thatch roofs. It was a miracle of what can be done with human labor. If you tried to do something like that in the United States with machinery and unions, it would have taken you a year. Now, this is, uh, this is one of our office's private little quarters. He didn't like where we were, so he built his own place. This is Major Hawkins, and that is a Burmese lungy that he's wearing. It's just a piece of tubular cloth wrapped around and, and tucked in in the front. Very practical. Colonel Ball with his P-51. Colonel Ball was six feet two, and he had a terrible time getting into this cockpit. Uh, those planes were not built for people as tall as he was. As you can see, <laughs> he's taller than the canopy, and he has to scrunch down. This is Major Susky, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant France. And I forget the name of the man on the right. And you know who this is. This is Ross McKee with his little girlfriend on the side of his little airplane, which I'm trying to learn to fly. And I am now in a spin. But I'm not going to spin in. I'm going to spin out in a moment, as you will see. Thank goodness. We're looking here at typical Indian landscape during the dry season. Not very green. And the rivers dry up. That's, that sandbar to the right is covered with water in the rainy season. Every inch of the land practically is cultivated. There are very few jungles left in India, except up in the Assam Valley. Those ponds, that little green thing is a pond. Uh, that's one without the algae on it. Those are used for every purpose in the world, for drinking, for bathing. Um, sanitation is something accidental. But the, uh, the Hindus survive because they're immune to many things that would kill us. All the cultivation in the Indian villages is still by, ox, by oxen and wooden plows, sometimes iron plows. Very little machinery half a century ago, and I don't think it's changed very much since. 
the country is simply so big and there are so many people and they're so poor that they can't afford the machinery. Now that's, uh, that was Colonel Elliott on the right. I'll tell you about him a little later. And here are some friends of mine looking over a bunch of nothing. And this is Major Mallon's Jeep. He's the intelligence officer and I have the use of it. And I later became the intelligence officer relieving him. This is Solon Goldstein, my roommate. You can see how he respects me. And uh, this is a warrant officer whose name escapes me, but he ran the, fl he ran the maintenance hangars that, that uh, maintained all our 150 aircraft. I started to talk about the 12 squadrons, and I'll get back to it later because now I'd like to talk about these guys here. This fellow is the information and education officer, and I took him around to show him India so that he could show other people. This is a local Rajah's palace. We used to go there and play bridge, Lieutenant Riley and myself. And uh, the Rajah was very valued our company because his wives couldn't play. He had four wives. And all they did was sit in the background and play um, music on their instruments while we played bridge. This is the village that belongs to the Raja. It's his property, the whole village. And the people and scenes you see here could, be t could have been taken 10,000 years ago, 3,000 anyway. They dress the same as thousands of years ago. It's a biblical scene. The people you notice are almost black. That's because they're low caste. They, uh, the Hindus, a fair-skinned people, came from the north and found these black people. They tried not to intermarry with them, and that, in order to do that, they set up the caste system, which has now gotten very complicated. Typical uh, oxen travel. Very few cars on the road once you get out of the main cities. Typical laundry, no soap. You beat the dirt out. This is a commercial laundry where we had our uniforms done. Now we're in a temple square at Karagpur, and there is a Hindu temple at that end, and we'll pan to the left in a moment, and that's a Muslim mosque. This is during the British period of occupation, and the two peoples, Muslims and Hindus, hated each other, but they didn't dare kill each other as long as the British was there. The minute the British left, all hell broke loose. You had bloodshed all over India, and we'll talk about that in a minute. This is the little town of Karagpur. This is the Indian side of the railroad tracks. Literally in India, the wrong side and the right side of the tracks is the way it is. The British all live in live, did live in fine houses on the right side of the tracks, and the Indians lived in shack-like places on the wrong side of the tracks. There's no running water in the houses. You have to go to a town pump. And this is the bazaar here, the stores where everybody shops. And the place is full of uniforms. This is a clothing shop. You see they have these wraparound uh, garments. You don't have to uh, make them into dresses. This is the shoemakers. And that, of course, is one of the town pumps. Another one. This is typical houses in the poor section. This is a typical poor family. 43 members in this family. These are members of the same family. What they're doing is they're chopping up forage for their cows. This is another family, four generations. Now, we step outside of Karapur, and the minute you get into little villages, you have little temples like that one you just saw. This is the village right here, about 300 people. There's another temple, the ruins of one temple, the front of another. There's a third temple, all in the same general area, very old. And this is a cart that's used in the processions. Now, out in the middle of nowhere near Karagpur was this temple. This was built by Sudras, low caste workers from Madras. And it's sort of an imitation of the great temple at Madras, which is 100 times the size. And what they do here, they show all of the mythology of India. In the front there is a wonderful scene of Krishna, the fun-loving god, stealing the clothes of maidens swimming in the river. You can see the girls have no clothes on and uh, he's hiding up in the tree. And there are scenes from the Ramayana. Uh, Rama was the U Ulysses, the Odysseus of, uh, of India, the famous hero. There he is with his bow and arrow fighting a monster. And here he is with his wife telling him to quit fighting. And there he is trying to shoot another monster. The story of the Ramayana is just like uh, the Odyssey. 
That's Hanuman the monkey god tearing open his chest and giving birth to some other god. The more scenes of demons and uh, demigods and myths, the crocodile and the elephant and so forth. And that is a baby, suck that's Rama suckling on Kali. And there's Mahatma Gandhi who has been deified by the Hindus. Now we stayed, uh, when uh, we went to a city named Puri, we stayed at a hotel uh, where our, me our hotel room was $3 a day with meals. We went to Puri to see the festival of Jagannath. The British call him Juggernaut. And they get the idea of rolling over somebody like a juggernaut from the fact that these carts, which carry the images of the gods during the procession, are not allowed to stop. It's sacrilegious for them to stop. So people used to throw themselves under the wheels, which are about 10 feet high, uh, in order to commit suicide. This elephant doesn't pull anything. He's just for show. People pull these carts. We're looking at this situation the night before the festival. And here's an early couple who's gotten up on top of their roof to watch. In the evening before, the, the Hindu priests, the Brahmins, have a procession through the street to sanctify the way, in the same way that the Catholic priests do when the Pope is making a walk around in Rome. Many of the Hindu rituals are quite similar to those similar to those of the Catholic Church. We're talking with some Australian soldiers who are telling us how things really are and why they are the way they are in this city. Over a million pilgrims come to this festival every year. There's our hotel, brief shot. And uh, these pilgrims are allowed to go through the carts before the procession. Our tour group, <laughs> of which I'm the tour guide, and the Red Cross girls in attendance are on their way to the temple to see the great show. The temple of Jagannath is about 300 feet high, made of stone. There is no stone in Puri. You have to go 30 miles to find stone. So the engineering of these ancient structures is just amazing. How did they do it? The main tower is in the shape of a human phallus. The two subsidiary towers are pyramidal. Only the high priest can go in the Holy of Holies of the tall tower. The other towers are for the lesser priests and Brahmins. You could see the pilgrims running around the cart. They get charged for that. The priestly caste of India has maintained its power for nearly 4,000 years. The Hindus are still doing the same thing that they did 4,000 years ago. It's astounding. It's the oldest living religion in the world and therefore it deserves some respect because of the fact that it appeals both to the higher class Indians who want a intellectual religion and the lower class Indians who want magic and folklore. Jagannath is supposed to be the ninth reincarnation of Vishnu. Vishnu is one of the Hindu trinity. You have Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer. No relation to our trinity except it is three gods. Now those images are being brought out now and taken into the carts and the crowd has grown to a tremendous number of people as you can see. The priests are running around in the courtyard like a bunch of old hens trying to get ready and they will start the procession by allowing some two or three thousand people to haul the carts with ropes. But before they do that, the Raja is going to have to come down and start the procession from his palace. That's the sister of the, uh, that headdress was the sister of the god. You can see her being carried through the crowd. You'll see also quickly a little spray gun. There was a man in a pith helmet spraying people for one rupee. The temperature on this day was about 120 in the shade. Now here are the Raja's elephants and they are going to lead his carriage through this crowd all the way to the carts. And he will walk around the carts, sprinkling holy water on the carts, and then he will go back to his palace for another year. That's a fellow with an odd disease. Uh, you find a lot of that in India. And uh, this is all he does, and for that he collects tribute from all the pilgrims, and he is worth an estimated $100 million, which he collects in tourist fees, you might say. Nice work if you can get it. And this has gone on.
for hundreds of years. Here comes the cart. The people standing on the cart are priests and railroad workers, and they're using railroad flags to tell the people to get the heck out of the way. You can see the size of the wheels. The only thing that they save from year to year are the wheels. The rest of the carts, which are built in the shape of temples, are torn to pieces and the pieces are sold to the pilgrims. The purpose of the uh, festival is to take the gods, that is their images, from their winter temple, which you just saw, to the summer temple at the other end of town, which you can see in the distance, I think. No, you can't. We missed it. So now that we have uh, done our duty there, we will go on and have a nice day on the beach. This is my personal lifeguard. He sits there and just watches me. If I go in the water, he goes in the water. And as you can see, it's a very nice beach on the Bay of Bengal, not overcrowded. These are some high caste Hindus that are, uh, that are bathing, just like me. Now we're in our little L-5 aircraft, and we're flying away from our hotel, and we're flying over the temple at Puri, so that you can get an idea of how big it is. Those are the planes. They're L-5s. They're called liaison planes. And maybe I'll have an opportunity to tell you more now about our organization. Yeah, I think now is the time I will do it. Twelve squadrons, four aerodrome squadrons, two fighter squadrons, three liaison squadrons, two troop carrier squadrons with DC-3s, two glider squadrons, and a medical detachment aviation. Now, if I haven't added up, oh, and a headquarters company. Now, what are we seeing here? We're seeing one of the most famous air raids of World War II. P-51 fighters can normally not fly very far. But this is a six-hour round-trip flight from our base at Cox's Bazaar in Burma down to Don Wong Airfield in Thailand, where the, what was left of the Japanese Air Force had taken refuge. They couldn't believe that we could fly down the valleys at 100 or 200 feet altitude, evading the radar, and take them completely by surprise, but we did. That's a Japanese zero that we're, we're working on. Now, you will see in a moment what these pilots can do. Um, we are down, these planes are down at 50 feet or 60 feet above the ground. Each pilot flies with a wingman. Now, Lieutenant Spann was the wingman of Colonel Chase. And you can see that they score direct hits on these revetments. These planes are in revetments. Most of them are bombers, not fighters. And you see he fires in short bursts. That shows he's a disciplined pilot. He doesn't just hold down the trigger. The reason you're able to follow this is because those are tracer bullets. There's phosphorus kill. Boy, that plane was gone, wasn't it? Now, that was a brief interlude. There'll be more of these camera films later, and I'll be able to talk about them more and explain how they worked. But in the meantime, we're making a trip to Old Delhi, which with New Delhi is the central capital city of India. And the sacred cows come right into the city. People tolerate them. They don't milk them. They don't eat them. They're just there. These pictures are pictures of the great mosque of Akbar the Great, the famous Mughal Muslim ruler of India, which, he con which his grandfather conquered in the 15th century. And that mosque was the place where many, many thousands of Muslims took refuge from their Hindu enemies during the partition of India after Lord Louis Mountbatten, the viceroy, threw in the towel and found he couldn't get anybody to compromise. They estimated that 10,000 Muslims were murdered and thrown in that pool. That's a sacred pool where you cleanse yourself, and the place was bright red with blood. Here's a typical herd of cows, Brahma, Brahma cattle, going through the city. Now, this is the great fort at New Delhi. There's a similar fort in Agra, which was the summer resort of the, uh, of the great emperor. All of these are buildings inside. This is the Hall of Public Audience. Uh, this is the mosque, which is inside the fort.
This is the uh, harem where the ladies spent the day. And that's another picture of the mosque. These are also pictures of the mosque. This is typical Islamic architecture, which was similar all the way from the Middle East, uh, from Turkey back to uh, India. And of course, these are places where Hindus go as tourists. Uh, uh, these are not just for Americans. These are the major tourist spots for all the Indians. Now, we left that area, and we're going over the mountains to uh, Kashmir. And we're going to land on the airfield at Shirnaga, which, um, which you've heard about, I'm sure. Uh, I had the job of going up there as intelligence officer and being a real estate agent. I rented 25 houseboats on the lake, together with bearers and food and bear hunts and everything else, horseback riding. We were able to make a deal where our guys could go up on R&R &R, uh, for $25 a week with food, with everything. This is the advanced party. These are Red Cross girls and pilots. The pilots get all the Red Cross girls. I know it's not fair. There are no pictures of Shirinaga because I had to go back to uh, the base and I wasn't able to explore the city at that, on that particular trip. Now, this is Agra, and that's the city of Agra, and next to it is the fort in the background. The fort itself had a population of 10,000 people. Both forts were built by Hindu forced labor, and when the forts were finished, because they contained mosques which were sacred, they killed all the workers uh, so that the uh, place would not be defiled. Uh, all the Hindus got assassinated. This is the Taj Mahal. I'm sure you recognized it. And it's located next to the Jumna River, a sacred river to the Hindus. Uh, the river is dry at this point in time. And later on at the end of these pictures, you'll see what, it, see what it looks like when it's in flood. This is a major point of pilgrimage for both Hindus, sightseers, and the faithful Muslims. These are aerial views of the fort, and you can see how enormous it is and how many buildings there are in it. Now, here are tourists going to the Taj Mahal. These pictures were made in the rain. Well, not really hard rain, but uh, it, was a, it was a very cloudy day. And these films are very old. It's amazing that the film, it was Agfa film, not Kodak, and therefore it was not as good as Kodachrome. Uh, it's amazing that it was able to last half a century before Hayward dubbed it onto the videotape. The Taj Mahal is not a mosque or a holy building per se. It is the tomb of the Mumtaz Mahal, the wife of the Shah Jahan, who was the grandson of Akbar the Great. There's a guest house on one side and a mosque on the other, and I can't remember which this is. The minarets, the four minarets around the Taj Mahal are used by the muezzins to call the faithful to prayer. And right next to the Taj Mahal are Hindu burning ghats where people who die are cremated. The Indians can't understand why we devote valuable real estate to uh, to uh, cemeteries. They think we're crazy. They have cremated their dead for, I don't know, thousands of years, I would presume. The Taj Mahal is made of pure white marble inlaid with semi-precious stones, onyx, tourmaline, agate, and so forth. And we'll get some close-ups of that inlay. They do the same thing on plates, which they sell to the tourists, and they're, they're extremely beautiful. Simply gorgeous building, beautifully finished, we don't go inside because I couldn't make movies in the dark interior, but there is a translucent marble screen inside that you can practically see through. Members of the first fighter squadron, whose names I'm afraid after all this time I can't remember. These are pictures of the outside of the fort. And this is inside the fort uh, looking at a stone bathtub. That's what that thing is that you saw in the front. Now, that, that quick picture was of the Taj Mahal from the fort, and you saw the river in flood. Here again, we have the same identical buildings. We have the Hall of Public Audience, the Hall of Private Audience, the Hall of Women, the mosque. This is the mosque. We 
when you have the power and the wealth, you just say to your architects and your contractors, make me another one of those. And three or four years later, it's done with 15 to 20,000 workmen working on it. Now, this is the little Taj, as it's so called. The Grand Weezer, or Prime Minister of the Shah Jahan, was a thief, like most of them in those days. And he stole enough money to build his own little Taj Mahal of his own. And the inlay work is even more beautiful and more expensive than the Taj Mahal. A good old political crook of the old school. Now, these are typical people of the caravan coming from the north. Here's the Jumna River in flood. What a contrast. It was almost dried up, and now it's 40 feet deep, and you have women banging the laundry on the, on the banks of the river, and uh, like there. Everywhere you go in India, people are doing the laundry. That's because they're a very cleanly people, even though they live in, uh, in a primitive way. These camels come down from Tibet. These are on the great route, the Silk Route. And that is the end of the pictures of India. But now, in a moment, I believe we will have some more gun camera film. So I'll just take a breath while that happens. Oh, I forgot all about this. Hayward has stills. And there is Kate Smith on the top uh, singing God Bless America. I won't say anything during these unless some thought occurs. Too bad you can't ask any questions. That's the petroleum building. The Power Authority, which this was, was a tiny organization in those days. Now it runs all the dams on the St. Lawrence River and supplies electricity to half the eastern United States. That's a lovely picture, isn't it? The trial on the Perisphere was such a lovely thing, it's too bad they couldn't have left them there. I want to say that Hayward did a marvelous job of restoring the color in this old film. It looks as if it were made yesterday. Some of these P-40s are still alive. Uh, you see them in air shows. I want to say something about Colonel Chase while you're looking at these. Colonel Chase was captured in the last days of the war, and he was imprisoned in Rangoon. And we were mounting, Lord Mountbatten, rather, was mounting a, th a trifibious assault on Rangoon, Navy, Air Force, and, uh, and uh, Army. And our part was to... Um, take some paratroopers and dump them in the Rangoon Delta. Well, what happened was I was briefing these um, Gurkha paratroopers and their English pilots and English planes in the island of Akiab, and um, I got a message in the clear from the back base in India saying that they had found, seen a message, one of our pilots had seen a message on the roof of the Rangoon jail and it said, Japs gone, dash chase. It was done in white rocks. And uh, so at that point, I turned to the assembled pilots, about 50 or 60 of them, and said, gentlemen, I believe that message is true. So just be careful not to get engine failure and have yourself a nice day. And I saw this horrified expression on the pilots' faces, and I turned around, and behind me, I hadn't seen them, was the entire brass of the British Southeast Asia Command looking at me as if they could kill me, because that's what happened. This huge mission, which has taken months to prepare, closed the trap on an animal that wasn't there. The Japs were indeed gone. They had fled south to Mandalay. Isn't that temple amazing? I think that's one of the most remarkable things. And to think that they would take those carts apart and put them back together again each year, and the marble work, of course, in the Great Mosque is quite good. This red sandstone is remarkable when you consider 
that it's over 600 years old. That's one of the things that is remarkable about India. There's very little air pollution. The industrialization of the country has not spread far enough so that these monuments are endangered. In Egypt, the air has become so bad in spots that the temples that were in good shape during my grandfather's age are now falling apart. Since they've dug the sand from around them, which protected them for through two or 3,000 years, they are now endangered. But these buildings are still standing up pretty well. At least they were when I was there half a century ago. Now we'll get the gun camera film. And I would like to make a confession because the statute of limitations has run. If you are one of my children or grandchildren watching this, your grandfather was a thief. These films were made by cameras that were stored in the wings of the aircraft alongside the machine guns, the 50 caliber machine guns. And they went off whenever the trigger was pulled or wherever a switch was put on to make them work. That is a Japanese zero. And you can see that, well, did we get them? I'm not sure. Now, these pictures, as I say, were made by the pilots on that famous mission to Don Wong Airfield. They were classified top secret, and they stayed in my vault until the end of the war. I inquired of higher headquarters whether they had to remain secret. And I talked to the right guy, and he said to me, Ross, the war is over. Do with them whatever you please. Well, I don't know whether that entitled me to steal them, but I did stamp them declassified. And I signed my name on them, and I took them, and you have them. And this is really the history of the prime achievement of our whole organization during the whole war. We achieved surprise. We had a notable victory. We destroyed over 60 Japanese aircraft on the ground. Nobody was able to get off the ground in time before we arrived, and we destroyed a good part of the military section of the airfield. Now, the story is interesting about that airfield, because remind, remind yourself that we are in Thailand. Thailand was neutral in World War II. It was the area where they built the bridge on the River Kwai, if you ever saw that old movie. And the Japanese were very smart, and so were the Thailanders, who we call the Siamese at that time. They, uh, they didn't uh, put up a fight. They said, come in to the Japanese. And the Japanese, in turn, treated them very well because they didn't want anybody stabbing them in the rear. So they made a deal. Half the airfield remained civilian in the hands of the Thailanders, and half of it was military for the Japanese. In our liaison planes and other small planes, we used to ferry OSS operators, Office of Strategic Services agents. They were the precursors of our CIA. And one friend of mine from Quag Long Island, Petey Juiced, was in the OSS. And I had to arrange for him to be ferried in to uh, Don Wong Airfield. And we used to put them in at night into the civilian airfield. The Japs couldn't touch them. And in the morning, they simply disappeared into the civilian background and did their spy work. Now I'll get back to this um, business. Major Pryor, one of our top pilots. We had two fighter squadrons with 26 aircraft apiece. That's 52 airplanes in the air, all banging.
all banging away at the Japanese at once. Well, it was a notable event, and the remarkable thing about it was that uh, we didn't have a single casualty on that particular mission. In fact, when I debriefed the uh, pilots after the mission, I asked them what problems they had, and they told me that the biggest problem they had was not being able to take a leak for six hours. Now, Captain Abrams' name just flashed up, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about him. It seems that as the war came to an end, the British had mounted a very important mission. They, uh, they called it a trifibious mission. It involved their army, and it involved their navy, and it involved their air force, and our air force. And I was assigned in that particular mission to brief a bunch of troop carrier pilots, both our own people and British troop carriers, who were going to carry a bunch of Gurkhas, uh, paratroopers, into uh, the Rangoon Delta and dump them out so that they could attack presumed uh, Japanese army positions at the foot of the Delta, uh, which were supposed to be able to keep the British Navy from approaching the city of Rangoon. Well, what happened was rather interesting. Colonel Chase, our executive officer whom I mentioned earlier, had uh, been, been uh, forced down in a later mission. And he was in the Rangoon jail. We had intelligence to that effect. While I was briefing the pilots of these troop carrier squadrons, I received on a piece of paper a message in the clear from our rear base in India, which said as follows, sign in white stones observed on roof of Rangoon jail, Japs gone, dash, chase. I looked at it, I read it out aloud, since it was in the clear to our assembled pilots, and I grinned at him and I said, well, I said, there you are. I said, just don't have engine trouble and have a nice day. And I saw this look of horror on the face of the pilots in the front row, and I turned over around and looked over my shoulder, and there was the entire brass of the English Southeast Asia Command. Everybody. And they had faces like thunderclouds, and I'm sure if they could have killed me, they would. But the fact was that the mission was an abortion. The Japs had gone. Chase was correct. He was free by the time the British 12th Army got, uh, 12th Corps, I'm sorry, got uh, down to Rangoon. Now, what about Abrams? After the war was over, it didn't end immediately. It ended with the nuclear bombing of Japan. And when the Japanese finally gave up, uh, we had the pleasant duty of flying in because our troop carrier squadrons were the only ones available to do the job. Uh, flying in to our old friendly Don Wong Airfield and going to the prisoner of war camp nearby and uh, liberating our prisoners. Not only ours, but some Dutch and some British and so forth. And uh, it was quite an occasion. Uh, Colonel uh, Fleming, the flight surgeon, and I as the intelligence officer were assigned to go in there. And when we got there, uh, Colonel Fleming and I both had 45s on, rather heavy pistols, and I was down to about 90 pounds. And uh, we looked out the window and saw all these Japanese lined up in rows of t in, a, in two rows, stretching from where the aircraft was to the hangar, about 100 yards away. Must have been 2,000 men, all fully armed, with the officers standing at attention with their swords that present arms. And Fleming looked at me and he laughed. He says, you know, he said, I'm not going to carry this cannon around. If they want to shoot, him, shoot us, let them shoot. And so we went naked as the conquerors through this uh, line of fully armed Japanese to take out our troops. Well, of course, they were delighted to see us. And they were all very in very good shape. Uh, nobody was starved or looking like the bridge on the River Kwai. And I guess the Japanese fed them up. And uh, so... Um, uh, we had no trouble until we got to Captain Abrams. It turned out that Captain Abrams, who was an entrepreneur in civilian life, had uh, started a PX in the PW camp, and uh, he didn't want to leave. Uh, that is, he didn't want to leave until he got his record straight and got rid of his stock to the local uh, Siamese. Uh, he was concerned because he would lose quite a lot of money if he did. 
So we told him that the war was over and Lord Louis Mountbatten was waiting for him in Calcutta and he said, oh shucks, and he got on the airplane with us. And in any event, when we got to Calcutta, the climax of the day was that when I got off the plane, I was so underweight and from being overworked and lack of sleep and heat and so forth, that the uh, newsmen looked at me and figured I had to be an example of a Japanese atrocity. They thought I was a prisoner of war and they grabbed me. And it took me quite a while to convince them that I was uh, not a POW who had been tortured by the Japanese, but the officer in charge of the rescue mission. And uh, I guess probably with that story, I ought to close. And so I will. And now uh, we're going to have a sound movie of our family reunion in New York, which I arranged in 1989, and which I hope all my children enjoy. Good night, au revoir. And uh, I wonder how many people are going to see this over how many years. I hope a lot. Good night. <laughs>